I want you to t turn with me to Matthew 11. S throughout this worship experience, you have heard these words in some shape or form. I want to read them in your hearing. If your Bible is like mine, these words are written in red. That means Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, beginning at verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. The 1964 Democratic National Convention took place in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It was at that meeting a brilliant black woman burst onto the national scene who happened to be a native of Ruleville, Mississippi. You know her by the name of Fannie Lou Hamer. She summed up maybe the sentiments of many African Americans across the country, but particularly in the American South, during the period of Jim Crow, when she simply said she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's what I want to tag this message today. Because I believe there's some of you in the building, even some of you online, who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. In January of this year, an article was published by Family Safety and Health. And this was the title of the article, Exhausted Nation. Americans more tired than ever. They surveyed 2,000 Americans and out of the 2,000 respondents, three out of five, that's 60% of them, responded that they are more tired now than they've ever been in their lives they are reporting that 69% of them said that working from home has disrupted their sleep schedule. Three, three out of five of those who are working from home noted that video conferencing was more draining than in-person meetings. People somehow are working longer hours. They're more attached to their electronic devices. They lack a regular routine. And all of this has contributed to this feeling of exhaustion. And it's not that people are not trying to deal with it, not trying to remedy it. As a matter of fact, you will discover that the sleep aid industry is one of the most lucrative industries in the U.S. economy, maybe even around the world. It's, it's estimated that it holds a market share of about $30 billion. People who just want a good night's rest. And then there are those who figure... <laughs> If I can't get a good night's rest, maybe if I get away, it'll do me some good. As a matter of fact, American Express conducted a survey of its travelers, and it reported that uh, over two-thirds of them said that they plan to take two to four trips in 2022. But if I could be honest and possibly free some of you all who were here, 
I just came off of time off. And I find myself not rested, but rather more aware of my exhaustion. I, I, I didn't register, I didn't know that two years of a pandemic of being locked in, of being at times preaching to an empty sanctuary in front of a camera and, and seeking to do all the things that relate to ministry and family would leave me at a place of exhaustion, but it, was, it is not something that is exclusive to me. I'm looking at all of you. You might not want to say amen or nod at me, but you too are exhausted. You're tired. It, it, it doesn't matter what generation you are in life. I've come to terms with it when I read the prophecy of Isaiah, that 40th chapter, before you get to verse 31 where it talks about those who wait on the Lord to renew their strength. Verse 30 brings me to a sobering reality where it says, even youths shall faint and be weary. And young men shall fall. I don't care how young you are. Nothing makes you immune from being tired. It reminds me of conversation with my divinity school academic advisor. I'd come to the end of my first semester of seminary. Noted theologian of our modern day and time, Mercer Law Wolf, was my academic advisor. And we were having an end of semester meeting. And when we met, I walked into his office literally sick and tired. The semester had worn me down. I had just completed exam week and submitted papers. I'd stayed up all night, burned the midnight oil. I was sick and tired. And I go into his office and the first question that he asked me is, how are you doing? And I told him, I, I'm feeling sick and I'm tired. And this was his response. Well, I guess we rest when we die. I refuse to believe that that has to be my reality or the reality of anybody who is in this place because the reality is this, if you do not rest, you will die. And I'm not going to wait till my eternal rest in order to rest. But y'all, there's good news for the weary, the wounded, the tired who are listening to this message. Jesus speaks to us in Matthew 11 and he gives you and I a remedy to the restlessness and weariness that we oftentimes encounter in life. And he is speaking not only to those who are sick and tired because of life, but those who are sick and tired by the legalism that is produced by religion. Jesus issues an invitation in verse 28, to all of us who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he's speaking to those who are weary. He speaks of those who've become tired because of their work and their labor and, and because of possibly a journey. And he speaks to those as well who are heavy burdened, who have found themselves weighed down from carrying heavy loads. You didn't have to say amen or not, but I can see it all over your face, even with the mask on. Some of you have been carrying some stuff that has you weighed down. Carrying your family through difficult moments, carrying financial burdens, carrying the weight of a difficult job assignment. And God is speaking to you on today and saying, I've got a remedy for that. This text teaches us totally, completely, and faithfully following Jesus for the rest of your life will lead to the rest of your life. Yeah. Let, let me say it again. You, when you faithfully follow Jesus for the rest of your life, it's going to lead you to the rest of your life. How do we deal with this weariness, this restlessness? Well, first of all, this text tells us we have to encounter God. 
Yes, Jesus says at the beginning of verse 28, come to me. But it comes after what he says in verse 25, 26, and verse 27, where Jesus makes an exclusive claim, where he says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. J Jesus is saying, if you want to be able to visualize the invisible God, look at me. Because in looking at Jesus, Jesus is the self-disclosure of God. He, he, all of God's fullness dwelt in Jesus bodily. And the beauty of it is this God that Jesus speaks of, that he proclaims in which he embodies, in which he is, watch this. Jesus in verse 28 starts out and says, come to me. He announces this powerful truth about himself. It, it's powerful because when Jesus called his disciples, he just said, follow me. But, but in this moment, in chapter 11 of Matthew, he says, come to me. He, he, to, too many of us, too many of us have been following after things that, that God has not ordained, that God has not blessed. And he's saying, before you get into all of that, I need you first to come to me. Don't miss it. Jesus is saying if we are ever to find a reprieve from our restlessness and to lighten the load that we carry, we have to come to him which is in essence saying that we need to have a fresh encounter with God. Jesus is extending an invitation. And at the same time, if we come to Jesus... We have to allow Jesus entry into our lives to have an all access pass to control every aspect of our lives. Jesus is calling his audience from mere involvement in a religious tradition into a relationship with the true and living God. I need to speak to us because so many persons in this 21st century have reduced our walk with Jesus Christ to a list of do's and don'ts. There is a standard that we've got to uphold. We, we ought to be people of integrity, but what the gospel is all about is God's determination to be in a loving, lifelong relationship with you and me. Don't miss that. Don't get so caught up in ritual and religion that you miss that. All that we have gathered today to do is to celebrate this relentless God who is so in love with us that he was willing to enter the human experience experience in the person of Jesus Christ to give us an example and then to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins and then to grant us eternal life and my sisters and my brothers so many of us have affiliated with a church and never enjoyed the blessings of relationship with Jesus and I need to tell you when we encounter God in this way it takes the stress off it lightens the load, it alleviates the pressure. In a very real and practical sense, our worry with work and fear of going away is rooted in us not fully surrendering and trusting God. Let me say that again. The reason why you're afraid to take off why you're afraid to have your day off each week that is rooted in our resistance to fully trusting in God. If we believe God to be all of who we say God is and all who God has revealed himself to be to us, we have to have enough faith to pause, to stop, and cease whatever we are doing, to step back, to breathe, reflect, and become rejuvenated for the journey that is ahead. And what I've learned 
is that whether you stop or not, the work will be waiting on you. So when you stop, when you take time off, when you observe a Sabbath, it is a call for us to trust God to handle it while we get away from it. I, I, I wish y'all would hear me. I wish you would hear me. Submitting your request for leave is an act of faith. It is an act of faith to step away and to trust God enough to know that while you're gone, nobody's going to take your job. It is to know your job is not in jeopardy. It, it is to know that your relationship with God and your relationship to work is not based upon what you do or what you have done, but it is based upon God being in complete control and what God has done for you. There's somebody who needs to go to the office in the morning, print out that leave request, and take some time off because you are weary, you are tired, and you have to have an exercise of faith and trust God enough to know that no, no need is going to be overlooked and your job is not going to be gone because you took some time to get some rest. Are y'all hearing me today? But then, then, then Jesus says, we've got to make an exchange. We've got to make an exchange for something that is greater. He says, instead of taking the yoke of the law, Jesus not only invites us to come to him, but he also institutes an exchange policy. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. A yoke was a wooden frame that joined two animals in order to pull heavy loads or to plow. And so when you read throughout Jewish teaching, they use this yoke in several ways. It, it was used to describe uh, sometimes the nature of the oppression of a foreign power that had taken control of God's people. That's the way Lamentations 5 and 5 speaks of it. But in a more positive sense, it, it was an image of the Torah, the great teaching of Jewish faith. It was an image used to describe the relationship or that tutelage between a teacher and their pupil. And, and those who were part of the Pharisee sect of the Jewish faith prided themselves on a extremely burdensome yoke because in the Torah understand there are more than just 10 commandments there are actually 613 in the Torah and they prided themselves on diligently keeping all 613 commandments in the Torah and this is exactly what Jesus was talking about he criticizes them for this in Matthew 23 and verse 4 where he says they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger but Jesus says if that is your life if you're burdened down by labor and legalism I'm offering you an exchange Take my yoke and learn of me that instead of you carrying the heavy burden of legalism and religious performance, if you come to me, I offer you the opportunity to take that yoke off and learn of me. That's a powerful image. Oftentimes, a good farmer would take a experienced, tested and tried ox 
and yoke them up with a young, immature ox. And when they yoke the young, immature ox up with the tested, experienced ox and cause them to plow together, that young ox, step by step, day by day would begin to emulate the behavior of that experienced, tried, and tested ox. Jesus is saying to us that he's on the other side of the yoke and he's inviting you and me into the yoke and if we walk with him day by day and step by step, we'll start talking like him. We'll start walking like him. We'll have a heart like him. We'll have behavior like them. But it will only happen when we take his yoke upon us. That's what Jesus is inviting us into when we come to him. He, he sets us free from the yoke of religion into relationship with him. And in relationship with him, we discover that we're not just free and wild, but in relationship with him, we have a responsibility to stay in the yoke. My brothers and my sisters, we learn of Jesus Christ when we read the Gospels. And he speaks to a weary world. And he exemplifies for us what we need to hear in times like this when we're sick and tired. Look at Jesus. His life was marked by spiritual disciplines that provided rest for his soul. When he started his ministry, he spent 40 days 40 nights in solitude, in the wilderness. Yes, he was tempted by the devil, but he went there for a time of renewal. As he engages and marks upon his ministry, you'll see him time and time again that when he woke up, Jesus didn't have his cell phone in his hand. He wasn't scrolling through Facebook. Now don't try to get smart on me. They didn't have Facebook back then. Don't do that. Don't do that. But the scriptures teach us that early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus found solitude so that he could be alone with his father. It was out of that that gave him the strength to do the magnitude of ministry. That, that's why in his toughest moment, there in the garden of Gethsemane, he took the disciples along with them. He had to leave a large portion of them behind. He took his inner circle with him. And then he himself went a little further, fell on his face by himself so that he could talk to his father. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus valued a long time. You would note oftentimes, as much as he had compassion on the crowds, he would oftentimes send the crowds away. He would send his disciples ahead and he would take some time for some me time. Y'all ain't hearing me today. You'll even note while Jesus and the disciples were on a ship in the middle of a storm on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus isn't up trying to steer the boat. Jesus is asleep on a pillow in the stern of the ship. Now I know I'm talking about a rest, but wake your neighbor up. Jesus is teaching us that when we have faith in him in the midst of the storms, it will allow us to go ahead to sleep because the God that we serve neither sleeps nor slumbers. All that I'm trying to tell you that when you pursue a life in Christ, it ought to free you to pursue those things that give rest to your soul and rejuvenate you for the days that are ahead. Here's the last thing, that when you come to Jesus, when you take on his yoke, here's the last thing, you've got to, you will have an experience, you'll experience the goodness. Verse 29 ends 
with these words on over to verse 30 where Jesus says this. You'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He speaks a word of liberation to all of us. He frees those of us who come to him from a do more, try harder, prove yourself religious experience so that we might find fulfillment in him. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus is saying, uh, reminding us that this, this yoke, this wooden frame, if not constructed properly, would oftentimes cause abrasions on the ox, making it even harder to pull the load because with every pull there was pain. But Jesus is saying, instead of something that will be abrasive, he's going to give us an easy yoke and attached to it is is, is not going to be a heavy burden. Jesus' burden is light. The burden speaks of our responsibility to Jesus, which is more about being than about doing. Oh, how... Our souls languish because we have a Martha spirit in a merry world. Or rather the other way around, we need to pursue a merry spirit in a Martha world. Spend more time being with God instead of always doing for God. Here's the reality, y'all. There's nothing you can do to be right with God because it's already been done for us by Jesus Christ. (laughs) He paid the debt. He satisfied all the requirements of the law. There's no more for us to do. But Jesus has yoked has us yoked up not for us to do anything but because he wants to be with us. And that's where we get this idea of rest for your souls or God's shalom, which means peace, but it also speaks of ultimate well-being. Here's the reality that Jesus points us to, that in being with him, we receive relief from our weariness and we find rest for our souls. There are some, some of you today Y'all looking at me and I'm looking at you and you're saying, I slept good last night. You're not physically tired, but your soul is tired. You're weary from always having to prove yourself and gain the approval of others. Jesus is saying, free yourself of all of that. Trust in me. And allow me to do the heavy lifting as you learn of me because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Y'all, we've got to make a determination that in life we're not going to be pigeons. We're going to be eagles. Pigeons, oftentimes their weight and their constitution cause them to be, you know, pecking down, eating the popcorn and crumbs that we drop. But no, no eagles, you don't see them on the sidewalk. Eagles are soaring. But what you discover about eagles is that their constitution, their design, their wings are so heavy that God has designed them in such a way that they don't have to work to stay in the air. They just soar. They soar because they depend on the wind gust and the updraft to keep them in the air. So they just soar with the wind. I'm talking to somebody in here today, somebody who may be online. 
You've been trying to flap your way through life. And you have flapped so much, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're burnt out, you want to give up. And God is saying, baby, I designed you to be an eagle. And so just go with the wind of my spirit and I'll allow you to soar in life in order to get to where I have destined for you to be. Do I have any eagles in the house on today? Listen, listen real quickly. I didn't come to shout you, I came to help you. Can I give you three things to make this live? First of all, I wanna challenge you to start your day disconnected from your devices in order to connect with God. Studies will tell you, you ain't got to take my word for it. But the reason why possibly you have such a difficult time going to sleep is because of all that blue light coming through your iPhone. So it shouldn't even be by your bedside if you plan to get into a deep, refreshing sleep. But when you wake in the morning and God blesses you with a new day, your first move ought not be to pick up your phone in order to go through social media to see what's going on in everybody else's lives. You better tune in to what the plans are that God has for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. So disconnect from those devices. Make your first impulse. It ought to be when the Lord lets you open your eyes and you realize you're still here, you ought to at least say, thank you, Jesus, for one more day. Yeah, I know your boss done emailed you what they want you to do, you know, with your morning and all that kind of stuff, but you better listen to what God has planned for you. So start your day disconnected from your devices in order to connect with God. Here's here's the second thing. We talked about this quite a bit last year. Practice a weekly Sabbath. You're not that busy or important. Now, all y'all are valuable to God. I love all y'all. You're not all of that, that you cannot give yourself 24 hours every week away from your work. You read the scriptures from creation. God set aside the Sabbath. They told us to keep it holy, but watch this. He blessed the Sabbath day. Meaning that when you do not practice Sabbath, you're missing a blessing. What I've learned, and I'm going to practice it, waiting for one week a year in order to compensate for the 51 other weeks of the year that I've run myself crazy ain't a good practice. And I mean it with all the bad grandma. You need weekly recharges you don't let your y'all keep y'all y'all cell phones on a charger all day your battery never has died you even have mobile chargers you take with you but why do you let yourself run on empty so i am determined every week going forward i'm i'm gonna take a 24 hours and I want you to do the same. And don't let it be Sunday morning. That's a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> here's a third thing. Real simple, not deep. You need to give yourself eight hours of sleep. There are too many negative or rather health risks that come from sleep deprivation. you will go into early dementia because you don't sleep. You're more prone to have a heart attack and a stroke because you don't sleep. 
And so I'm challenging you, trust God enough to go on to bed at night, to get some rest, to refuel, to let God's design work in your life. And make a determination today that you're not going to participate in a weary, restless world. But you're going to connect with God. Because when you connect with Jesus, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. If you're weary, disappointed, wounded, you need to rest. If you're weary, disappointed. If you're wounded, rest. No, 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 no. If you're wounded, if you're disappointed, if you're wounded, you need to rest. Listen, if you're here today and you are wounded, weary, disappointed, sing that reprise. You need to rest. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ and his invitation stays the same. He says, come to me. So as we're standing all over this place, I know I took a little bit of time, but I need to get this word to you today. Because God wants you to flourish. Just sing that reprise. If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, we welcome you with open arms. If you want to unite with this church, we'd love to have your spirit part of this fellowship of believers as we seek to be a movement of wholeness in this fragmented world if you're in this room right now in this very moment I want you to make your way down to this altar we're, we're, we're right here ready to receive you make your way down to this altar so you can find rest for your souls if you're here today and you want to unite with our church come down to this altar we would love to have you as part of our family of belief. We're going to sing, but in this moment, you need to be making a decision. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You need to come right now. If you're... Make your way, make your way. Come on. I see you. Come on, I see you. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Come on. Somebody else needs to make a decision. Come on.
Come on, let's celebrate these who've made a decision today. Hallelujah. As you're taking your seat, if you're in this building, if you're online and you know that you know that you know that you know you need to make a decision and you're a little bit shy, I want you to send an email to connect at the boulevard.org or text, that's right, I said text, the word belong to 901-446-4242. You're going to receive a link in response to your message, click that link, fill out the form that appears, and submit that information, and our team will be in touch to help you with your next steps on your journey.